Hi everyone, it's Ryu from Japan and today I'm gonna be doing a reaction video to this video called 1954 John T. Antillon from the Philippines debate Israel, France, UK, USA and topic is criticism of America so I'm really excited to check this out so please enjoy. Play. In nationwide competitions in their own countries and for the last almost two months now they've been living from for two week periods 1954. in the homes of American high school students it's like almost 70 years ago being walking textbooks if you will, with a full program of school activities during the daytime, and I understand uh, community and teenage activities after that. We're going to be talking about some of the misconceptions there are around the world about America, some of the misunderstandings, some of the criticisms, and the reasons for them. This half hour is simply a chance to give you an idea of what goes on for much longer than half hour periods hmm. when this group of 32 students, or any portion of the group, gets together. First, here is Peter Hudson from the UK. He lives in Newcastle. Uh, shortly after he his was born, now, Peter was taken to Hong Kong, where his father was in government service. And when the war broke out, he and his mother were separated from his father, who spent the whole war as a prisoner of war. Peter and his mother were in refugee camps in the Philippines, uh, later lived in Australia, finally got back to England just as the war ended. Peter is now head prefect of his school and a champion debater. Uh, next is Johnny Antelone of the Philippines. Johnny Antelone. Johnny hasn't taken very good uh, advantage of his educational opportunities. He only, only, he can only speak nine out of the 86 languages in the Philippines in the some 200 languages. Wow, 86 uh, languages in the speak. Philippines. He's also, just a minute, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> He's also going to miss his graduation exercises on April 1st in the Philippines. Uh, too bad because he's valedictorian of his class. Uh, chairman of the Debating Society, editor of the school newspaper, uh, president of the Student Council, and I can't tell you how much else. Uh, we're sorry, you'll miss it, Johnny. You'll be on a plane on the way home. Next is Nurit Auerbach from Israel. Israel. Nurit's parents came to Israel from Germany. She was born there in Haifa 17 years ago. Isn't that right? Nurit. Uh, representing United States students is John Criz, who's a senior at Princeton, Princeton High School, that is, and John is 18. Well, all right, what about some of these criticisms of the United States that are current in your countries? How about you starting, Peter? Oh, yes. First of all, the one big criticism is that Americans... He's the guy from UK. ...as though they were working an assembly line. Another one is that they try to run international politics like big business. They, they tend to see things in black and white, instead of as Britain sees them in black, greys, and then down to white. They tend to try and make big decisions and heal things with a quick stroke of the pen, whereas Britain allows time to take a big part. And the third big uh, fault we find is that very few Americans are able to differentiate between socialism and communism, hmm. which makes it rather difficult for me as an Englishman coming from a welfare state. Well, those are uh, three points, certainly, Peter. Uh, how about you, Nuri? Um, as for me, I couldn't understand at first um, that the Jews here are first of all American and then Jew. Um, it was very difficult for me to understand, as an Israeli, how how any Jew could live in any in any foreign country and and feel safe and secure. I, after what has happened in the Second World War. And, uh, well, it was rather difficult for me to realize that. How about you, Johnny? We've heard from the Middle East and uh, Western Europe now. John, about here comes Johnny. Media? Well, speaking for the Asians, I can say that one of the, some of the points that bring the greatest resentment between America and the, and the Asians is, are these. First of all, you have the desire to run everything from the Asian point of view. And second, you bring with you an aura of superiority which greatly infuriates most Asians. You have a smugness, a complacency, a complacency that infuriates us and makes us think that you consider yourself the best people on the top of this world. And then the other point is that you have so much, much inconsistency in your foreign policy all over the world that most Asians do not know what to expect from the United States. We live from day to day in a state of jitters, not knowing whether today you're friends with us and tomorrow you sell us down the river. Hmm. And then the fourth point is that in helping us, we believe that there are catches. There's a catch in everything you do. I will not say that this is true, but we believe it very much. 
There's one other thing, Mr. Yes, Waller. Peter. Uh, one misunderstanding between Britain and America. Most British people love to laugh at Americans. We love to laugh at your gum-chewing habits. <laughs> Teenagers take so much importance about dating. Well, it's, it's psychological. We need the psychological uplift. By laughing at the Americans, we cheat ourselves into thinking that we're your equals in power. I wonder if that uh, fairly penetrating observation is applicable elsewhere in the world. I wouldn't say that for reason not in Asia, because Asians have never felt that we needed psychological tricks in order to place ourselves on a par with America or any other country. We believe that we have points where we are superior and that we do not have to look for other points where we are inferior. We recognize that there are some points where you are high, some points where we are high, some points where you are low, and some points where we are low. Would you say that that feeling of superiority is just as prevalent among Asians, their superiority, as you find the Westerners feel their own superiority? Yes, in fact, you mentioned that now when an incident comes to my mind. I met a boy one time from the Western Hemisphere, I shall say, I shall not mention names. <laughs> and, and one night he told me, while we were in the same room, that he considered most Asians as racially inferior, mentally inferior, psychologically inferior, physiologically inferior, inferior per se. And it struck me, it surprised me, because just a few years ago, I had heard a Burmese boy use almost exactly the same words. A boy from Burma? From Burma. Use the same words? That is what did he say? He said that you were immature, shallow, unperceiving, unperceptive, and words like that. And, and that the Asians were the superior ones. Hmm. That is right. Well, one way of finding out whether we are or not is getting together and knowing each other. But what's your point about feeling that there's a catch in everything Americans do in Asia? I'd like you to explain that, if you would. You see, Asians look at the United States helping other countries in this way. In helping other countries, you make them so strong that they become powerful competitors or may become powerful rivals. Now, this is like slicing your own throat. We can hardly believe that you would do this without some ulterior motive, so that we believe that anything you give with the right hand must in some way be shadowed with the left. He sounds so smart, and like Johnny was like, I guess he's a high school student, right? It's like kind of funny, like how he doesn't act like a high school student, but he acts like he's like, you know, he's like a president of the Philippines, you know what I mean? Yeah, wait a minute, Johnny. <laughs> well, that surprises me. Are you knitting your brow, John? Well, I don't quite see that what oh, the way it's American he says guy. this, there are misunderstandings on both parts, and yet I don't quite think that he says that we do everything with an ul ulterior motive, but then don't we treat, when we find our own neighbors in trouble, don't we treat them with, in exactly the same way in which we help the other peoples of the world who are less fortunate than we? By the way, I when I said, I did not use I, that I believe it. I said that that is the general feeling in Asia, that there is something, a cut in all your motives and in all your purposes in Asia, and for that matter, throughout the world. You see, it may or it may not be true, but it is a fact that such a feeling exists and persists, and that is one of the greatest points that separates the East from the West. Hmm. You what, feel like, so, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Well, what are you going to do about it? Do you think you can do something to, to dispel this? To dispel this is not our part. Since we suspect you, it is for you to make advances or to do some things that will cause us to believe you more, to trust you more, to feel that you're capable and worthy of our trust and confidence. Well, but for example, Johnny, uh, we've been giving a great deal of aid to Asia. Yes, but you see, I will tell you. When you give aid sometimes to countries, you come there with that air, you know, where you say, well, our way is best. Your way is not so good, and if you don't take our way, well, that's just too bad, but you see how you are, you backward people, you, you don't know what you're doing. We know what we are doing. In other words, there are times when they force aid upon us at a time when we do not like it, or if they do not force aid upon us, you sometimes give us this aid without giving us a chance to participate in helping to build ourselves. Mm. That's what I meant when I was saying that America tended mm -hmm. to employ big business tactics in world international uh, politics. I'll clarify that point. For instance, in the few years after the war, you helped other countries and you gave them large gifts. But you should remember a wise saying that charity has a bitter taste. And you gave it as if you were giving out alms. But today you have a better program, I think. You give us a chance where we put up 
of everything you give. And that makes us feel much better. It gives us a feeling that we're participating in this program of helping ourselves. When you talk about uh, feelings of distrust toward America, is that true also? Do you also distrust British motives? Or is it just America? I would like to bring out the fact that pr one primary reason for our distrust of America is our distrust for Britain and France and all those countries who went to Asia and exploited their poor little brown brothers. Hmm. I won't say we exploited them. They she has really good points. That they, could, they didn't know how to use. We went in, we gave them a lot of things, but we took back in return. That's why when America gives you so much, gives Asia so much, the Asians think they must want something in return. Now what is it? Now look, Peter, when you say that you go to Asia and you didn't exploit it, what do you mean? Look, when you went to Malaya, for instance, yes. did you give them a chance to be educated on the same level? Did you give them public school educations? Did We're you give them a chance to be did you give them a chance to be educated in technical schools? Yes, you said you're educating them now. But now it's too late. You have allowed the trust, the distrust and mistrust to build up. That I admit, that was Victorian and Georgian and Edwardian England. Whether it was Victorian, Edwardian That's or Georgian England. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not blaming I you. No responsibility for what my country did before I was born. All right. I'll merely say that those facts uh, did exist. And those facts still color our present relations. I grant you that. Uh, I don't want to cut off your discussion on British imperialism, but Eric out there is simply dying. Yes, Eric's here. Eric's our delegate from France. He wasn't on the program, but he's here in the studio, and he's been having apoplexy out here. And I think, uh, all right, Eric, come on in. Tell us what you want to say. You might as well get it off your chest. Johnny's so smart. Well, I think uh, you have failed to mention one of the very basic criticisms that I've noticed here. There's something that you up here and. I think especially French people cannot understand it's your fear of solitude. Here people hate being alone. In one of my family I had misfortune to say that I adored being by myself. Well they almost sent me to a mental doctor. <laughs> and here when you can enjoy yourself and enjoy comfort of leisure and solitude, you no, you don't do it. You get another job, you join another club. If you get a job, it's to get more material comfort, to get more money. And that's thing that we cannot understand. And another point which I noticed here is that... Uh, oh, how could I say that? Wait, say it in French. <laughs> Why? Why Nobody... can't I? Go ahead. Um, oh, gee. Well, you've given us a mouthful already. If you think of the other one, tell us. Oh, but this... Eric, I don't quite see that. Have you ever been with an American when he was alone? No, I, well, I don't know how I could, but I've never seen, I've lived in some American families, but I have never seen an American being alone. Well, Eric, unless you peep through a keyhole, maybe. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I'm here <laughs> for. <laughs> <laughs> I must look things I shouldn't see. Well, Eric, perhaps it's this strong feeling of individualism among French people. Perhaps is this the reason for your weak, uh, uh, your weak government? Don't you think so? Yes, it might be that, but I think, for my, that's my own personal point of view, I think um, in the United States they are killing the individual and trying to make people live in a group. They don't care about the individual. In my country we care about the individual, see? Oh, yes. Maybe it's worse for the government. I, it certainly is, but I like better that than uh, living in a group and having nothing, which really belongs to myself. Don't yes. you think, uh, Eric, that if you follow this individualism to its logical conclusion, you will soon lead yourself into a state of, shall I say, anarchy? Or a state where 80 million people have 80 million parties and they can't agree on one single darn thing? There's only 40 million people in France. <laughs> <laughs> only 40 million parties. <laughs> 40 million parties. <laughs> yes, uh, what do you want to say, John? Well, look, Eric, uh, you, you have to understand that America is a composite of all sorts of national groups, races, and so on. We ha we came here. We did. They we couldn't encourage individualism. Otherwise, all these groups which you see here today, mostly blended, would be still individual groups. We wouldn't have the solidarity of our country. We wouldn't. We wouldn't be what we are today if we didn't. The main point of our education, you might say, is to make good citizens. Yeah. We haven't been concentrating on making individuals because. Making individuals would have killed America in its crucial, uh, crucial stage of its, exi in its existence. 
And what about the implications from the rest of you? What about the implications of Eric's point that we care too much about the, that everybody likes to be alike, we care too much about uh, the common man and that the person, the, in, the real individual, the uncommon man, if you will, doesn't get enough chance. Hmm. Do you think that's true? I think that in some way it could be true. I could point to one instance, for instance, uh, in your public school education. You put so much emphasis on mass education mm -hmm. and you put double the emphasis on mass that you do on education. That's you allow students like, yeah. to club the public schools without dividing them according to their mental ability. So what happens? You put a genius and a moron in the same class. And what happens? In order for the class to proceed in a sane manner, you have to cater down to the moron with the result that you pour down this poor genius, make him frustrated, give him very little chance to advance. And you know that there is nothing that stifles intelligence so much as restriction. Strangling the intelligent person mm -hmm. in the embryo. So that you yeah, might see that there is a sort of educational suffocation in America. Mm -hmm. I think I have to be sort of defender of the American <laughs> system. I haven't noticed that. I think that the uh, American system gives the opportunity to um, the more advanced pupils. When I've noticed the honor classes in, in the schools I have visited, I have noticed the advanced classes in which when the math advanced, they give the uh, more, more gifted uh, pupils the opportunity to get much more that, uh, what, what they can uh, get. Actually, this is not true because except for a few exceptional schools like mm -hmm. science schools, when they are the rare exceptions, you find that pupils are admitted into a classroom without any regard for mental ability. No grading into A, B, C, D, or E. And no adjustment of teaching ability to the type of mentality you have. Johnny, uh, Johnny, Johnny sorry, go ahead. how much do you know about this? Have you, have you made an extensive survey of this? I wouldn't call it an extensive survey, but as you know, in sampling opinion, you do not necessarily have to ask everybody, yeah. but you get a cross-section of opinions. So what I did was to talk to several principals, ask them if this method of giving entrance examinations in public schools is a widespread or a national practice, and they said no, except for certain schools like vocational schools where they have to judge your aptitude. Those are the only kinds of schools where they give you entrance examinations. So you see, I sampled educational authority, people who ought to know. <laughs> Uh, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> Johnny's a genius. <laughs> You're obviously an expert debater. <laughs> but could we come back to one or two of your points of criticism in Asia of the United States and criticism in Western Europe of the United States? Uh, from where do you get most, or do your people get, most of their information about the United States? I think uh, one of the main... Uh, a source of the information they get is the movies. Oh, yeah. uh, the movies, that's yeah. one. Now, what else? And I, I don't think it's a very good and very true source of information. Well, what about what current affairs? Get? How do you get information about current events mm. in America? Well, speaking for my country and for most Asian countries, we get our information about America, her domestic policies and her foreign policies from American magazines. American magazines? And I'm not trying to give a plug for any of them, but Without mentioning, you have like, you have the Herald Tribune, let us say, or the New York Times, or Reader's Digest, or Coronet, can you see? But I was thinking more of uh, reports in your newspapers. Do they come from the regular press agencies? Yes, yeah. but a lot of uh, British newspapers, of course, have correspondence in Washington and uh, New York. But what about uh, government? I think the whole of the free world watches uh, every move that uh, Washington makes. It's the political barometer of the free world. I think it is, Johnny. The political barometer of the free world. You don't agree with that? I wouldn't say that. Why I not? So. Barometer in what sense? If America decides on one thing, then it's advisable for the rest of the free world to sort of tag along behind America because America's paying out so much to the rest of the free world in aid. Oh my That's God. probably the catch. Oh, but no, 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 no. Peter, we don't pay it out. We don't expect to be dished back something in return. What we, are, we're, we realize that we are more fortunate than a lot of peoples in the world, and we, we, we try to help them. We don't dish it out in, ex in expectation of getting something in return. Yes, but there is that uh, mistrust, as Johnny said. All the money's coming in with the right hand, you've got to watch the shadow of the left hand. That's right. That's what I think the shadow of the left hand might be. Uh, you. Uh given quite a lot of trenchant criticisms of the United States, and John is outnumbered here, four to one. 
Uh, would it be fair to ask you uh, what you think about some American reactions, such as why on earth, with all the help we've given to Europe, doesn't she get together in some sort of an EDC? And uh, when is Asia ever going to start getting some kind of Asian federation so that the countries can work together? Mm. Is that a fair question? Certainly. I will answer it for Asia. Good. Now, you ask me, when is Asia going to get an Asian federation? That time will come when each country in Asia is confident that being a member of an Asian federation will guarantee her not being dominated by another Asian country. Uh, what sort of future, <laughs> how, what long-term future are you looking for? We're looking toward the time when we can disregard countries like India. Because look, India. if they go into a federation, an Asian federation, they will naturally dominate that federation. And we don't like that. We want to wait. We want to wait until the time when we're strong enough to be able to tell India where to get off. And we, <laughs> <laughs> and we think that they in far off. Today we prefer unilateral agreements with the United States, single agreements, where we can trust the United States, at least my country can. Well, we hope you have the time. Of course, I'm uh, guilty of what Peter says all Americans are guilty of, wanting to get things done in a hurry. But uh, do you sincerely think that the threat is so slight that you will have all this time to wait? You know, that is one thing. Most Asian countries live so near communist China, and communist China is daily growing a greater menace. And yet, there is less fear in most Asian countries of communism than I have noticed in America. Or at least, we do not publicize communism so much in the Philippines or in other Asian countries as much as you do in the United States. Is it because uh, your mag sai sai has gotten rid and has found a good solution to get rid of communists in the Philippines? Yes. Now, when I say this, I'm speaking entirely for Filipinos. Mm. You see, when you have a sense of security at home, you're inclined to feel secure about the rest of the world. So that when Mag President Magsay Sai lessened the threat of communism to such a great extent in the Philippines, we feel much secure now, more secure. Is it fair to ask now about this European Federation? Eric's over there, too. He ought to give you some support. Well, I think what Johnny told for Asia is quite true. We don't want a nation to become too powerful in a European community. And I think what America is doing now, it's to help a nation become much more powerful than the other one. That is? That is right. Oh, well, you know. Germany, all right. right. Well, but would you like to have a little more English help in uh, what you are doing in uh, oh, European... Oh, sure. I think that uh, England could make a kind of balance between France and Germany. Yes, could be the third, uh, third country, which... That's called Britain. She's far more <laughs> Commonwealth-minded. Yes. I mean, we have garrisons in countries all over the Commonwealth. I know Johnny's just thinking they'll get rid of your Commonwealth. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of countries in the Commonwealth who don't want us to get out, believe it or not. And we have garrisons in, well, let's just take here, Hong Kong. We have garrisons in Gibraltar. We have garrison in Suez. And if we sign a European Defense Community Pact, it means that we have a block of troops, a certain number of troops which cannot be moved out of Europe. And we may need to move troops out of Europe. I don't think there's any real danger in Europe at present. Yes, sir. I want to say something. We have the same thing all over the world, French people. We have troops in Morocco, in Indochina. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see why we should do something that's going to weaken us on uh, broad countries and lands. If you don't do it, it's really unfair, because we should defend Europe for you, and you shouldn't do anything in return. You see? Oh, but we would defend Europe. Britain and America have promised that in the event of any uh, immediate necessity or danger, they will send a supply of troops as much as they would have if they signed a pact. We don't think a pact's necessary. But do you really think there can be a European defense pact or any kind of European Union without Britain? Well, you know, the channels are wonderful, <laughs> don't overdraft. <laughs> and I'm being very insular, but I think a lot of British people are insular. Well, then, uh, have we no hope of, of more European Federation? You're making me very depressed, you two. Well, I don't know. I don't see any need for any European defense community when you have North Atlantic Treaty Organization, because an EDC is just uh, a block of NATO, which is forming a club. Well, what about you, Eric? France? I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just asking, 
Uh, from what you two have been saying, I gather the fact that uh, one country is afraid to be less powerful than the other country. That's why they don't want to join the EDC. Sure. It's the same with the Asian no, countries. Yeah. So what? Don't you trust each other? Aren't you friends? Does it matter well, whether he is weaker or you are weaker? So long as you help each other, don't you trust each aren't other? Aren't you friends with India? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. No, well, we are friends. Not very. I wouldn't say that besides, the Asian situation is different. Each country, most of the countries in Asia are trying to gain a distinct personality. So we cannot afford to mm. join an amalgamation at this time. And because that would erase our personality entirely. And you I mean, don't that think is what we feel. You don't think from what Eric said that France is trying to maintain a distinct personality of being individualistic no. and different? They can come in a federation because they already have distinct personalities of their own. It is just a meeting of friends. Whereas if Asians come together, Asian countries which are new, that would be just like running one piece of plastic, hot plastic into another hot piece of plastic, and we don't want that. We want to build a personality first and then join together. Eric mentioned Indochina a moment ago. Have you got a 30-second solution for America as to what she should or shouldn't do in Indochina? I won't say what, what America should do in Indochina. It's really out of my province. But I do want to say that the people of Indochina desperately want their own freedom, their own right to call their country their own. And I believe that if France would give them an equivocal, an equivocal answer to the effect that they will have Indochina once this war is won, you will get a lot more support from Indochina than you already have. But, but Johnny, you when will the war be won? <laughs> I'm not a prophet. Well, isn't that more or less what happened in the Philippines? There was a serious communist, communist menace in there until after the war, and the Filipinos really began to... The Americans left completely, and the Filipinos really began to deal with the, the problem themselves, and now Nagsaysay seems to have it pretty much under control. That is true, John. Because when America left us to remove the communist threat in our own country, we had a country Johnny, to fight for. I'm sorry, that's See? a good note to end on. I think in all fairness to the students who have uh, willingly expressed many of their criticisms of the United States for our edification, I ought to quote you in closing a word that Johnny said just a little while ago. He said one of the things that he likes best about the United States is that when you talk to people here about the future, they talk as if there was going to be one. Hmm. Till next week then, at the same time, as Helen Waller saying goodbye for the New York Herald Tribune. All right, so that was um, 1954 debate, Johnny and Dylan debate Israel, France, UK, USA topic, it's crazy America. Um, it was like really interesting video and I have like many points that I want to point out that was like really interesting. What he's saying, his message to us, he said in 1954, is still kind of still true like 70 years later now in 2021 and like about the stuff he says like really true and like it still like hits people's heart and like it gives a strong message to the world and even to me who's like Japanese but I'm um, same Asian with him it gives a strong message they talk about the future and like the world peace and it's like you know it's kind of still that like in like 2021 it's kind of still like not happening like perfectly you know I hope it happens in the future and like you know what I feel is that like what the message they say in the 50s 1954 is still being watched on YouTube on like in 2021 by many people so like I feel like as me who makes like a lot of blogs on YouTube like I should say my opinions so like you know maybe people in the like seven years later will watch it and like you know they will like agree to what I say and like the message I say might be true I hope my message like you know like I need world peace and I hope that you know world peace will happen you know later and like I hope like I can spread message from today to you and um, I hope some of my message about world peace and like you know it, my message will be understood to people in the future so that's maybe why I make these videos too Alright, so thanks for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and check out more videos. And please let me know in the comment section what you want me to check out, what you want me to do in the channel. Alright, so thanks for watching today. See you.